Okay, so I'm going to turn your attention to Sarah Lloyd, who will introduce her panel um, and take us into the next session. Just one note, don't forget um, that the Creative Media Convergence, Opportunities for All, is running simultaneously in the other room. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Sarah Lloyd. I'm the Digital Director at Pan Macmillan. Um, I look after our digital strategy. It's a change management role, really. Um, how we adjust and uh, integrate digital. And I look after all our digital publishing formats. And I work across the adult and children divisions. <coughs> I'm going to talk today about children's content. Um, I'm going to be discussing how digital trends and technology are affecting children's content. And with me I've got Kate Wilson from Nosy Crow, um, Jeff Gomez from Starlet Runner, Eric Huang from Penguin, and Belinda Rasmussen from Pan Macmillan. So before I ask the panel to introduce themselves, why the focus on children's publishing this year? <clears throat> well, in adult publishing in the UK and the US at least, ebooks have made it into the mainstream, we all know that. But it's largely just been a format and a channel shift, and not so much a content design revolution. And will this be different for children's digital content, we are going to ask ourselves. In the children's content arena, ebooks haven't really made a dent yet. This is mainly because formats haven't standardized and the devices haven't really made their way into children's hands <coughs> to enough of a degree. But there are plenty of examples of um, interactive digital content plays for children outside of ebooks. So what can we learn from those? Today we're going to ask ourselves some key questions. When will the moment come for children's publishing to go digital in a meaningful way? And what will be the catalyst for that change? And what's going to be different about the children's digital transformation and what will the key challenges be? And how can today's children's content producers and publishers position themselves for what's coming? So to help me, we have four very talented and lovely people. And I'm actually going to ask them to introduce themselves now. And if you could all just say who you are, what you do, and perhaps just outline one key challenge that you think we're all facing in the children's content market at the moment. Thank you. Kate, starting with me. Um, I'm Kate Wilson. I'm the managing director and founder of Nosy Crow, which is a uh, small, new children's publishing company publishing in both print and digitally. Uh, we publish... Um, prize-winning, uh, multimedia, uh, very highly interactive apps, as well as straight um, print books. And I think, the, in many ways, the, uh, the challenges are ones that I know we'll touch on in, in a lot of um, this session, discoverability, um, which, of course, is a theme that I think we, we have um, throughout this conference being a key issue for children's products as much as it is for adults. Well, I'm Eric. Uh, I work. I'm the publishing director for media and entertainment at Penguin UK, and um, I look after uh, traditionally a, a licensed publishing media tie-in list. So books behind TV, TV and media brands like Peppa Pig, Doctor Who, Moshi Monsters. I'm also heavily involved in the digital strategy for the children's division, and also look after business development. So looking at new formats, new ways, mainly digital, of uh, telling stories and reaching our consumers and. Like Kate, I think the biggest challenge is uh, discoverability. How, how do we, we can make cool stuff, but how do we get people to find it and buy it? And I'm Belinda Rasmussen, and I head up Macmillan Children's Books. And I think my biggest challenge at the moment is, yes, doing something exciting in the digital world, but also making sure that our authors and illustrators uh, are happy with what we are doing, what we are creating, and, and that we are doing it in collaboration with them. Okay, and my name is Jeff Gomez. I'm the CEO of Starlight Runner Entertainment. Uh, we're a production company based in New York City, and we specialize in helping um, uh, the, the big movie studios and video game companies and uh, uh, very soon uh, book publishers uh, take intellectual property and develop it for multi-platform uh, so that the, uh, the world of the story is extended uh, across multiple media platforms in powerful and innovative ways. Um, the, uh, the, the challenge that I see uh, uh, forthcoming is that uh, uh, new kinds of partnerships and new kinds of uh, uh, concepts are going to need to be applied to the development of intellectual property 
uh, for this purpose. Um, and um, and uh, for publishers, intellectual property is going to become uh, more and more vital and central as we move to the digital platform. So what do you do and, and how do you best leverage um, uh, th that property? That's my job. Okay, thanks guys. So hopefully we're gonna pick up on some of those key challenges as we go along. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions now and get the panel to speak, and then after I've run out of questions, I'm going to ask you guys to come up with some as well towards the end of the session. So to kick off, um, why now? Why are we talking about um, digital and children's as a key theme this year uh, in 2012? Is it going to be the digital year for children's <coughs> publishing? And if so, why and what's changing? Well, I had a publisher saying to me at the Bologna Book Fair a few weeks ago that he was convinced that it was a question of 12 to 18 months, so maybe not quite this year, but early in 2013. And what had, uh, so that was a fairly exact forecast, I thought, and what had <laughs> <laughs> kicked that off for him was that for the first time, he had seen a YA title. It, it, was, a, it was a title in a series, but the, the third or fourth book in the series was selling stronger in ebook format than in physical format. So that was quite an interesting observation. So the teen market is, is clearly sort of taking off, and you can see perhaps why that might be, because we've obviously got a so many of black new and white e devices yeah. and, and so on in the market. But I wonder about <coughs> the younger children segment, whether people feel any different, sort of different forecasts about that area. Yeah, I think, I think the preschool, and especially for color publishing, I think this year has been a big focus for us, starting from the second half of last year at Penguin, digitally. I think just because of the proliferation of all the devices again, um, you know, there's so many videos on YouTube and everything, you see how two-year-olds are, are interacting. And I think um, it's just also, for, for me specifically, being on the licensing side, the media entertainment side of, the, of, of publishing, is that all of our competitors, so like the Disneys, the Nintendos, the Nickelodeons, are really in that space. And because we you know, work with companies like them, and also, you know, Moshi Monsters Club Penguin, we see what, what, what they're doing, and they kind of pull us along. So a lot of the the titles and the books and the stories that we're publishing um, became digital quite quickly, almost sort of like six months after the physical books came out, and even something like Peppa Pig as well. I think, you know, be, being part of the larger children's media landscape in the side of publishing that I do has meant that we've gone a lot quicker, um, and having these big brands also helps immensely with discoverability. Of course. Um, I suppose I felt like I came out of a corporate publishing background, and um, while I, I loved all my corporate employers, um, I, I felt that um, I felt that in some ways some of the things that I'd wanted to explore in the children's area had been difficult to do in a corporate context where you had a machine that you had to feed and um, it was hard to stop that machine or to build on another part of that machine, particularly during <coughs> tough times and, and, and margins are, have been tight in publishing for, for some time, certainly in trade publishing. Um, so I found that when I set up Nosy Crow, which I did at the beginning of 2010, it was always our intention to be doing digital books, um, or digital reading experiences, um, from the beginning. And, and we were in this interesting position where we had no books, we had no IP, we had no things that we had to squash onto a phone quick. Um, so uh, we were able to decide what we would do from a digital starting point. And um, the first apps that we did were not adaptations of books. They were ways of telling traditional stories, in fact, Cinderella and Three Little Pigs, um, from a digital standpoint. And I came to it by saying, what is it that the device can do that will make this reading experience more engaging for a child? Um, and so I suppose I felt that that was our, that was our starting point. And, and for me, 2012 hasn't really made any difference relative to 2011, except that the proliferation of devices has already, I would say, impacted on our sales. And we've seen pick up in sales of what are after all backlist titles following Christmas. And that's not because we've put out anything new or made a particular fuss about things. I think it is just good word of mouth around good product um, reaching more people because there are more devices. I think um, there is stunningly uh, rapid uh, adoption going on. Um, we're, we're tracking the adoption of tablets and, and uh, these sorts of devices um, at, at a faster pace than almost any other technological evolution. Um, in the United States, 
um, uh, something like, according to Kids Screen, uh, 30 or 40 percent of, of parents have uh, stuck their mobile phones or, or uh, tablets into the hands of their their infants, <laughs> uh, little little uh, kids, and what what is um, what is happening? Uh, I feel really is that um, particularly with tablets, you are removing the last frontier of of, of friction. Okay, the the handling of a book is difficult for a very very young child. Um, uh, they have to know how to turn pages. They have to uh, be able to to manipulate um, uh, this this thing. Whereas with a tablet, you don't need to know how to work a mouse. You don't need to know the concept of folders or anything. It, there's a direct uh, connection and relationship between the child and the the app or the the the, the digital book. And it is um, it is manipulatable with tremendous ease, and um, and that causes delight not just for the child but for the parent. And you're going to see, I think, a, a, a cascade effect. I completely agree with that. I think one other thing to add is that for preschool children or for children who cannot themselves decode text, the addition of audio and control over audio in um, preschool apps is, I think, a really fascinatingly empowering thing for the child. They no longer have to yeah. know the text themselves well enough to be able to read it to mm. themselves or to pull on the parent's arm and say, read it to me, read it to me. Now they can re have it read themselves. They can control when that happens and how that happens. I think that's a very powerful thing. And I, and I think that it, it's, it's been so quick for children's publishers, and I do think that children's publishers are leading because I was having a discussion at lunch about how our consumer demands this type of format, whereas I think for adult publishers, it's, 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 a, it's a nice thing to have, it's cool, but our, our, our consumers demand it. Yeah, I mean, you might almost say that um, for adult publishing, it's, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of cool to have the kind of enhancements. And um, whereas for children, it's absolutely what they want. We've always had interactive books, actually. Mm. Uh, it's not very different. It's just that we're moving those into digital formats. What else do we think is um, different about uh, digital content strategy and creation for the children's market over the adults' market? Sarah, could I just go back and comment yeah. on some of the yeah. things that get... I think it's true, but I think it's also a little bit that is our, you know, it's true that it's very easy to make a product that's very easy for the kids and it's, of course, very engaging. But I think as publishers, that's also a bit the challenge because actually mm. there is, the book has an emotional value in that you read the book with your parent or your parents read the book to you. And I think what we need to sort of be careful of as publishers is yes, to create products that are engaging and fun and give the kids, they learn perhaps something new, but of course it would be a shame if that came at the expense of the emotional value of the mm. book, of the parent sitting reading. That's a great point. So it, let's tie those two questions together then. So talking about digital content creation and strategy for the children's market and the different types of things you can do with children's content digitally, um, how, how can we introduce those and at the same time kind of integrate parents and children together in the experience. Does anyone want to comment to that? I think in some ways, I mean, when you're thinking about digital formats, it's, it's, it's not that different from when you're trying to think of how to create a, a physical novelty book. So if you wanted a physical book that was interactive and it's about sitting down with a child or, you know, that, that does stuff, you can't just kind of slap flaps and pop, pops on it. There has to be a reason, and I think, with the digital format, I think the word digital kind of, you know, we use it so much that it kind of becomes meaningless. It's just, what does this story device do? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it just had to be thoughtful. And the process of figuring out what makes sense isn't different, it's just a different technology and I think being familiar with what this device can do. It takes a, uh, a design sensibility, uh, I, I believe, uh, pr particularly if there's any sophistication uh, um, uh, to the product at all, um, it, it pays not to simply have a, an author and illustrator who are guessing at, at how best to um, uh, uh, create an interactive experience, but to bring in um, designers or, or people who are trained in, in uh, eliciting 
um, a, a degree of interactivity with the uh, with the product, who uh, who understand the psychology and who understand uh, the delicate sensibilities that go into uh, putting together a product like this. Um, it does require, I think, uh, a, a certain third-party professional. Yeah, and I think a lot of us, you know, being in book publishing for a long time, we have to unlearn. You know, there's no gutter. Do we need a page turn? That type of thing. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I think um, that we we create all of our apps in house, and I think that um, what Jeff just said is absolutely true. We being a publisher was not enough. Being a children's publisher was helpful though, because as a children's publisher you were already used to working in, if you like, a multimedia way. We already had text and illustrations. We already imagined the reading aloud of many of the things that we were creating. So in some ways we had a, an interesting starting point. Um, and we found that we then added Audio capability, I had a little bit of that, but I have extended that audio capability. Um, music composition, um, commissioning skills, for example, I've learned animation, commissioning skills that, um, that we've certainly learned, and, and critically coding. Um, I would say that for us, the difference, one of the key differences between um, traditional trade publishing, certainly adult publishing, which I've had short experience of, um, is that it's a much more collaborative process. Right. And for us, that's been very important. We, it's hard to look at any of our apps and say, this person made that. It is, mm. This person is the author mm. of that. We have writers, we have illustrators, we have animators, we have composers, we have voice talent, we have coding. Um, it has so far been a more, to make a rich experience, it has required more input from many, many different disciplines. I, I do believe that um, we're going to see a rise in and artists who have a, a, a true uh, creative uh, and overall vision for these products. Uh, s someone who can, uh, who can write, but also who understands the fundamentals of interactivity and, and design and production. Um, and, um, and those are going to be the, the new kind of uh, uh, children's uh, uh, book rock stars. So do we think that will almost be a bit more like the film industry where you'll have people who are a little bit more like directors or producers who might come with the ideas rather than an author just coming with the text or do you think it might work in lots of different ways? Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of the people who, who come from a traditional publishing background too, they've grown up learning that it has to be this way mm. and so I think the danger is a lot of the people that we get who have written, who, who are traditional writers, they think they're writing an app or writing a web something but they, they look at it from such a static book perspective that it's very difficult for it to work. I mean, you have to kind of redo the whole thing. And certainly linear versus non-linear Lin yeah, is absolutely. the key in, in this. For sure. So how are we going to bring along our own sort of authors and illustrators? I mean, talking to, um, I don't know exactly what this audience is made up of, but I'm assuming there's a fair few traditional publishers in the audience. Uh, and those of, those of whom are children's publishers, how should they bring along their, their authors and illustrators into this new world? Can, can you give any tips on that? I mean, you can pair, I think, pairing, pairing. up um, a traditional illustrator. I mean, and also, I, I do think that, I mean, some of the digital picture books that we're, we're debuting this year, um, you know, th there are traditional artists and illustrators that we're using because their aesthetic matches better what we need to do. Um, but just pairing them up with an animator or pairing them up with a developer and also a writer with a developer just so that they can learn from each other. And I, I think, just think certain people just have more of a natural interest. I mean, imagine all of us on this panel, you know, we've come from very traditional publishing backgrounds, mm. but we have natural interest. Um, and if you're interested, it, it's just easier. And so s some authors and illustrators are, are already interested. So have, have you found there have been any challenges in that, where you've been doing these pairings? You don't need to name names, but um, <laughs> how, 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 what kinds of things, what kinds of issues have arisen? Have there been disputes or disagreements about the, d the direction for things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, I think that a lot, I think number one, a lot of people are, and I think, it's just, it's kind of seeing this word digital and it means nothing, mm -hmm. but then it means too much and so they're kind of crippled by it. So they don't know what to do. And then when you're, you kind of release that and kind of the gates are open, you kind of go all the way on the other side and say, we don't have a million pounds to spend on this, <laughs> on this, one, on yes. this one title. Yes. Um, so they get over ambitious once they, yeah. once they see the potential. Although, although we're learning too, yes. so we don't know. And I think yes. some of our yeah. things that we've done were, were over ambitious as well um, and late. 
and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Kate, have you got any tips on that on that one? I think it's perhaps diff slightly different for Nosy Crow because we always said we were digital. So mm. I think the people mm. we're attracting yeah. and the yeah. agents who are bringing authors and illustrators to us do so and the authors and illustrators who approach us directly, and, and many do, um, they do so be because we ha we are establishing a little bit of a name for ourselves in this space. So I haven't had to drag anyone kicking and screaming, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, um, to Appland. Um, I, I suppose I think that there are certain authors and illustrators who are great on the page, on the printed page, and, and you know we should leave them there, and that's fine. Uh, and I respect them for that being the space that they want to occupy. And there are people who fall into that category that we would publish and would try to publish very beautiful pitch books where the object itself was, um, was important and exciting. Um, Eric talked about novelty books, and I find that when I'm creating apps, a lot of thinking about apps, a lot of the thinking that was applicable to novelty books is, is very, applicable, um, very applicable to this. But there are things that you can do on the page, particularly novelty books, where you can have holes that are cut through, you can have bits that feel a particular way, you can use scale in a way that you can't, we're constrained at the moment by the size of the screens that we're dealing with, um, that can be very exciting, and, and I think we should leave those people there. And, and we the should collectability be, as well, right? And we yeah. should be saying these are people whose story works best in this medium. Hmm. These are, this is a story and a set of illustrations that work best in this other medium, and we shouldn't confuse them, or it's I, mean, I know cross-platforms, you know, the sexy thing. Um, but um, sometimes I don't think things do cross-platforms necessarily terribly well, and that's fine. <laughs> Revolutionary um, thought. Um, Jeff, I'd like you to respond to that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to. <laughs> if I were to offer any advice, um, uh, really, it would be for you to learn this. It is vital for you to understand where this is going because it's going there, okay? And, um, and not simply to learn uh, what a digital book is and, 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 um, uh, and, and, and how to turn storybooks into apps, but to, to learn where uh, this is going and understand where this is going. For example, uh, far too often we're encountering publishers who see uh, 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 digital children's books as um, uh, the equivalent of, of choose your adventure. Um, the, um, uh, the mistake here is that interactivity <coughs> simply means uh, uh, a choosing through some kind of branching uh, format. Um, and yes, you're going to see a lot of that uh, as, we, uh, as we move into this, but true interactivity, real interactivity, is about involving the, the reader as a participant in some form or another in the narrative um, so that the decisions that the uh, uh, participant makes and the activities that the participant performs have an impact, uh, a, a, a subtle and overt, on the outcome of the narrative. That's deep interactivity, okay? And, and that participation is more than bells and whistles it has to do with the theme and message of the narrative. Um, that's where you're going to need um, good authors who also have an intrinsic understanding of uh, the interactive process. And that's where you're going to need teams that aren't simply slapping together uh, someone who can create an app with a good a children's book author and illustrator, it means that they have to learn from one another in order to weave something that is truly new, an evolution of the format. I think that's a really interesting point, and I think that question of how you use the features of the device in ways that are appropriate for the story is an interesting one. We did a Cinderella and from my perspective, when I kind of ended up thinking about this, I thought Cinderella is really about three things. It's about hard work, it's about appearance, and it's about magic. And how can we use the hard work aspect, so you can help Cinderella do her various chores, how can we play with the idea of appearance and how far that does matter and how far that doesn't matter? We ended up introducing a mirror aspect into the, into the um, app. And, and magic, you can, you can choose what color Cinderella's dress is, for example. You can choose, you, you are the person who transforms the, um, the, the various things she's collected into the coach that she uses to go to the, to the scene, to the, to the ball. Um, and I think that 
that was a very different set of use of the features of the device from the ones we used in Three Little Pigs, for example, mm. which were about um, drama and action. That was about movement, that was about chases, that was about, it was different. It's not about magic, <laughs> it's not a magical story. No. And so you have to think about, you can't use the same gadollop of code for mm. each thing. It's, it, to make it meaningful for the child, you have to be responsive to what the nature of that story is. And I think that really does speak to what Jeff's just right. said. Thank you. Um, I'm going to change the subject slightly now. Um, one of the things that I think we're all trying to overcome, and uh, speaking as a digital director who's been working uh, in the trade or consumer publishing area for quite a few years now, um, one of the things I think is toughest uh, as you move a market and as you move people internally towards a new market is the whole issue of sort of physical book is good, screen is bad um, issue. And I think that when it comes to children's publishing, um, this, is a, this is a particular issue. It's a sort of particular psychology of parents. It might even be a particular psychology of um, particular authors, illustrators, people within the business. Um, how do we overcome that in this uh, new world? Can, does anyone want to speak to that? I, I think that perception is really just a, it's a legacy perception. Um, I, I haven't found that any of our consumers, anyone that we talk to who actually, you know, um, buys and enjoys apps and digital formats, I, don't, I haven't found that anyone thinks screen is bad in that way. I, I do think it's, an, it's just an old-fashioned way of thinking. I think parental exhaustion goes a, a long way through everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> as a parent, a I think what, um, what parents say they do and what parents actually, actually do, do. Yes. Um, two is things. two very different things. And yeah. I speak as a very hypocritical parent. Um, <laughs> but so I think that's a really important issue. I'm so with you on that one. Yeah. So I think what we aim to do with our children, and I, yeah. I have two girls, and um, certainly I thought the first one, and this was, you know, they're older now, but um, I certainly thought the first one would grow up entirely entirely um, in a house that had Lego and, um, and wooden bricks and books in it, and that was all. Um, how differently life actually turned out, and she minced around in her fairy costume and um, played with Barbies the whole time. So, I mean, I think what we intend to do and what we do is, is, is very different. I do think that there's an evolving parental in interest in what the content is. And I think that one of the things I feel that we have an advantage in if we are presenting reading experiences on apps, uh, as, as apps or on, on screens in various ways, is that it is the least worst of the things that some parents feel that they can be offering their children. So if it's a reading experience, that can be something that they can feel more positive about than um, Angry Birds, perhaps. Um, and I think that that's not a bad thing. I think the important thing then is to is to balance that parental sense that reading is good for you, wherever it takes place, perhaps, mm. and the children's expectation that something that happens on that screen will be interactive. I care a lot about literacy. I care a lot about children continuing to read for pleasure. The last thing I want to do is to create reading experiences that are the least interesting thing a child can mm. do on an iPad. That strikes me as being a, a terrible thing for us to be doing. So I think we have to balance up that expectation, the, those sets of expectations. In terms of that evolving parental thinking, I think one book that I'd recommend is by a woman called Lisa Guernsey, and it's now called Screen Time, but it was called Into the Minds of Babes, and she's just updated it with a, a, a tablet time kind of epilogue. Um, but she's very much saying it's not about screen time versus non-screen time. It's about the quality of whatever it is we're offering mm -hmm. to our children. But also building on that, I mean, I have to admit that I'm still a very traditional mom in that I, if I'm completely honest, I prefer my son sitting in the sofa reading a picture book rather than him sitting in the sofa with the iPad reading a picture book. I know that's stupid, but <laughs> that's being honest. <laughs> but the fact is that for him, there is no difference. Mm. He, he doesn't have that sense. And I think that's, that's just what we, you know, that we, we can have that, but, but the kids don't have it anymore. For them, it's just a story <coughs> and it, it's just different devices. I think quality hey, is key, isn't it? Yeah. Let's throw some cold water on this. <laughs> Behind <laughs> closed doors, and I've, I've spoken to a few publishers out of the New York scene. Let's face it. Uh, uh, children's books make money, a good amount of 
money. <clears throat> and um, the expectation right now on the part of publishers and certainly on the part of the consumer is that they won't make that much money in the digital format. The money is smaller right now. And that's a big, um, uh, you know, stepping on the brakes for a, a lot of publishers. And, um, and my response to that, th there, there are two. Uh, number one, the, the notion that um, uh, digital content uh, should be much, much ch cheaper than physical content is going to evolve away because there is a generation that is growing up, believe it or not, uh, to uh, uh, appreciate the value of digital content. Um, they will get there. I know it's hard to believe right now because some of us have teenagers, um, but um, uh, digital content will be perceived of as more and more valuable. But there is a, a, a more important thing for you to think about as um, the wooden aspect of the product uh, uh, slips away more and more in the years to come. Um, there are new kinds of partnerships that you're going to have to form with your authors uh, because um, it's going to take um, a, a little bit more investment on, on your part um, to, to uh, uh, push this digital content through the chaos, the pervasive media that, that is uh, uh, you know, overwhelming everyone. And um, you're going to want to take uh, a, a little bit more interest in the intellectual property because these intellectual properties will more easily extend themselves across different media platforms, not just as reiterations of the product, the book, but as story worlds that will start to manifest in animation and graphic novels in television and film. Um, uh, we're starting to see those kinds of partnerships emerge with the YA and adult fiction uh, uh, partnerships that we're seeing. Um, uh, I, I believe that's coming. It's heading your way uh, on the children's front. But I don't think that it, it hasn't been in publishing quite as in the music industry. I don't think publishers have been stepping on the brake to protect. Mm the physical book, or at least, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think if it's taking, if it's looking from the outside as if it's taking quite long, it is because on the children's side there hasn't really been a market mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. recently, but I think the publishing industry has to some extent reacted very differently than the music industry to the whole digital revolution. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about authors and publishers and illustrators and other sort of people involved in uh, what the new digital children's content might look like, but we haven't talked much about kids, and they're really the key user group here. Um, so what do we need to bear in mind about the differing ways in which they're now beginning to consume content and interact with content? I mean, I can think of various themes, is the whole prosumer trend, um, the fact that supposedly are, especially teenagers are, you know, completely have no attention span left and are only able to sort of do multiple tasks at once that all take seconds. Um, and then there's a sort of the going social and online aspects. So taking those or any other themes about the way that children and teens uh, consume content, how can we answer those? Eric? I think, I mean, something that we learned where, you know, the first apps that we launched were all for preschoolers and then we have an in-house development team and we created a, an app for Mind Candy for Martian Monsters and that's for, for older, so six plus and really just eight to nine is probably the, the key age. And what we realized is that um, with an app like that for kids who are used to you know, interacting with a brand that's constantly changing, like they have to update the website daily, weekly, we realized that all of a sudden, you know, we created this Moshe Monsters app and it was great, it was selling really well, but it was like having a child. We now have it forever. <laughs> you have to constantly update it, there's constant maintenance. Um, you know, the whole idea of out of print doesn't really exist yet. I mean, every time an operating system changes, you have to spend money to upgrade it. Um, and they expect it to change um, quite often. And that was something we didn't, I mean, yeah, we didn't really realize. Yeah, um, that's a bit of a shock. So yeah, it, it's something that needs to be living and breathing and constantly they're constantly changing. Yeah. I think you avoid that a little bit if you're doing things that are for younger children and yes. our focus is, is two to seven. And in that context, I think, just as with picture books, familiarity is important and mm. the reasons that 
TV brands become so significant to children of that, I'm thinking about things like Peppa Pig, to children of that age group, and favourite picture books become so important to them is, is because they like that familiarity and the safety of, of that. I also think apps provide a kind of safety for parents too. They are quite walled gardens, mm. and that is a positive thing, I think, for many parents. They're not um, being let, let loose on the, on the, um, in, in the wild world of the web. Um, and I think that a lot of parents find that very reassuring. Um, that's one of the reasons that we're actually quite careful about allowing children to get out of the app once they're in there. I, I think it's quite important if a parent's trusted you with their child's time and their child's energy and their child, and their money, um, I think it's important that you, you then respect their sets of expectations around that. So we are very limiting of, we can allow children to do a lot within the app um, and uh, interact with it in, in lots of different ways, in, in creative ways increasingly, in apps that we're developing at the moment and, and in terms of making choices and in terms of making things happen. But I'm not, certainly for younger children, very keen on letting them out of that garden. What about older children? I mean, Jeff, um, you talk a lot about you know how we're going to need to think about IP cross-platform because of the the way that children, especially teens, are starting to come to to content now. They don't expect it to be necessarily in one box. Sure, uh, um, uh, teens certainly, but also tweens more and more. Mm -hmm. um, we're we're learning that uh, young people are. Uh, uh, s switching up between gadgets, devices, and screens um, uh, at a, a more and more rapid clip. And um, uh, uh, one of the, the solutions to this is not, again, not uh, necessarily reiterating the same content on all of these platforms, but offering um, uh, uh, different types of, of content that play to the strengths of each platform that are set in the same story universe. So in essence, you're, you're doing a bit of branding and a bit of franchising, uh, but you're keeping um, uh, the, the child or, or the teen in the story world that they love and that they are, are becoming more and more intimate with. Um, it also helps in terms of the fact that, um, that as uh, uh, children grow into their tweens and teens, uh, they're becoming uh, much more uh, immersed in interactive content, particularly video games, where there is a, a non-linear world that they're uh, getting to explore. Um, they're, they're solving problems in, in uh, several different kinds of ways. Um, it's just not one uh, straight narrative uh, anymore like <laughs> 80s arcade machines. Um, and, um, uh, and so, um, it, it, it behooves us uh, to tell the stories in ways uh, that they're used to receiving the stories. Mm -hmm. If they don't get that, they're going to search for, for a, a story world that does furnish um, uh, these kinds of alternatives. Having said that, I thought it was the funny or die guy said something very interesting this morning about professionals, which I guess we'd all like to believe that somehow we have a professional <laughs> set of skills. Um, but one of the things that I do think uh, he said that was useful was that user content, user generated content wasn't always terribly good. good. <laughs> um, and that one of the things that the authors and illustrators that we have already and that are evolving into this space is, is an ability to tell a linear, linear story. And I, 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 I think that balance of what's a linear narrative and and, and what is not linear and how far you allow non-linear space, perhaps even within a linear narrative, is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I think that stories with a beginning, a middle and an end are things that are very satisfying for children. Mm -hmm. They don't always want to make their own story. They don't always want to make their own story. They still like films and they still like books and they still like, they like stories that are better than they can imagine. Yeah. The reason that J.K. Rowling worked is because it's better than any of my children and neither of my children can imagine. It was, it was a better story than they could tell themselves. Believe me, I've seen their writing. Um, it, and that's a really important thing, I think. Yeah. But do you think, Kate, that that will continue? Because there are some research, right, that brains have already changed in terms of how children perceive information. And do you I, think that linear thing will continue? I think that our, you know... F I, you know, you could get all sentimental about this, but I, you know, we all, we are all descended from people who gathered round fires in caves and told stories, illustrated <laughs> with cave drawings, about how they, the mammoth that got away. I mean, in the end, we are storytellers. 
We are storytellers. We tell stories to one another about what happened on holiday. <laughs> I had a conversation. I knew what Sarah did on holiday. Um, we have these conversations all the time. Our our our, our conversations are our, our story. And yes, we can fragment story. Yes, we can cut it up. Yes, we can make different ways of telling stories. But the importance of of linear of of, of stories that satisfy us. Um, I don't think that goes away. You know. I, I uh, by non-linear, I didn't mean that, that we're raising a generation of kids who would immediately understand pulp fiction. <laughs> um, what, what I mean is, is that <laughs> um, there are new ways to think about story worlds. Thinking about a story world that is a living, breathing world where as you're moving through the linear story, there may be other things happening oh. elsewhere in the story mm. world that are unfolding on different media on different platforms. Levels. Yeah. That, that's yes. all I'm really yes. saying. Um, they, so they're all linear, yeah. they're all they're kind really, of self-contained, yeah. but they're complementary and they add up to a deeper so and richer experience. So you might a little experience. bit like game have satisfaction uh, points rather than it being an end point at which everything kind of Something ties up. Like Listen, guys, we've only got about 10 minutes left, so I'm wondering, two minutes left? Mm -hmm. Your watch isn't first. <laughs> so um, can we just have a few questions, or a couple I'm of questions? <laughs> Does anyone want to ask anything? Yes? So, uh, wondering what the panelists think about backlist titles. When you have illustrated books that were designed to be a perfect two-page spread, and uh, the money isn't going to be there to convert it to an app at you know, 10, 20,000 pounds a pop. And if it's perfectly laid out in two pages, then no matter how good your HTML5, your EPUB3 conversion is going to be, you're still going to be butchering it. <laughs> is there a future for these titles in the digital world? Does anyone want to answer that, Eric? Maybe? I haven't got any backlinks. <laughs> yeah. It depends Easy. on the story. I think it depends on the title and the story. Mm -hmm. It just whether or not the story itself and the artwork itself and just the experience of it lends itself. I think I think it just depends. I think that that um, the the ability to move um, digital content from one media platform to the next to best enjoy it is is just around the corner. Um, uh, my widescreen television <clears throat> might be the perfect way to look at those two page spreads. Got one question down here. Uh, yes, this is Ken Michaels. But um, if you look at how content is converging and what's going on between television and movies and desktops and PCs and laptops and all of the government rules and regulations on FTC rules versus radio, and all the different factions that you have to deal with as content navigates horizontally. Do you see an evolution of government mindsets or agent mindsets to allow rights and content to flow freely between all of the different channels? Anyone wants to ask that one? I mean, in my experience, I think five years ago, a lot of the, pub, the digital titles that we publish, the various agents or licensors and studio, you know, studio media companies that we have the rights for now would, would have just said no. But I think it is starting to happen. Um, I think one of the things to make that easier is we'll say, you know, for, for specific things like, say, Moshi Monsters or Peppa Pig, it's not exclusive. I think there's a lot of kind of rights expectations that we have dropped, whereas in the past with something physical, yes, we want exclusive all rights, all languages world. Um, I think in the digital space, especially when you're dealing with the likes of people like Disney, um, you know, don't grant me overall rights, but let me show you, show you a project. If you like it, let me do it. I think it, in a way it comes down to that thing of uh, talking about, from a traditional publisher standpoint of proving ourselves. Yes. So mm. if we can just get enough rights to prove that we should, are the worthy uh, holder of those rights, then I think we can move forward, can't we? Yeah, and many times I mean, we had to spend our own money and prototype first and show yeah. them. Mm. Yeah. Because just to say, oh, we can yeah. do that, you're Penguin, you're book published, why would we? But you, you just have to show them. Very from, good. From the government standpoint, we're seeing countries like Canada and Australia um, uh, do many things to promote multi-platform. Uh, there's an interest there in, in getting their populations digitally literate 
and in, in promoting commerce uh, in a multi-platform sensibility. And we're seeing um, uh, new uh, uh, funding models and new uh, laws uh, that are allowing for a, a more free flow of content across platforms. Okay, I think we can have time for one more question. Mike. As, as the children's content market evolves across all these various platforms, and as the book, as a, the printed book, particularly the printed book in stores, diminishes in importance, how do book publishers keep this business? Why wouldn't the business really start with game creators, animators, television studios, who would then hire the book publishing expertise they need, if they need any? That's the big question I think publishers are facing is, is children's content publishing going to remain with book publishers? I'm are you thinking about that? Answer. Does it concern you? Um, I hired people with video games backgrounds. That's what I did because I did recognize absolutely I didn't have the experience that I needed to make these things myself. And, and I felt, and I know that a lot of publishers are going this route and that's absolutely fine for them. But I felt that as a new publisher with no IP, I couldn't afford to then farm out the making of these things to somebody else. I, I had to have a core competence. I had to have a core thing I was offering to the market. And I didn't have penguins, generations of marvelous stuff. So, so I felt that one of the things we could bring was a kind of hybrid set of skills that were about storytelling and about story shaping and about story selection, which is certainly something we've done. You could be the though, right? You could be Nosy Crow could be what is taking the business away. Is somebody the tweeting this? Uh, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I, I'm telling you, if you don't do something about this, that is exactly what's going to happen. Starlight Runner, my company, is creating a multi-platform story world. Where did we want to start it? With publishing. And we had a, a, a publisher who was very seriously interested in this and willing to commit a lot of money to transmedia, the multi-platform implementation of the story, but books were going to be the beating heart of the series. Where did we run into trouble? The editors rejected the notion. The editors could not wrap their heads around the fact that a piece of the story was going to unfold on Facebook. <laughs> um, that social media was going to be a key component in the telling of the story, not the marketing of the story, the telling, telling of the story. We, had, we went to Sony. So on that Sony challenging pictures. note... <laughs> That's my concern. Well, we're going you to have to wrap up, go. guys. I said a question, not yes. a Shatskin question. Oh, <laughs> that's the one that could set us talking for the rest of the afternoon. So that's a, that's a challenge to you all. Um, and on that note, we're going to leave the stage. Thank you very much.